Okay, folks, this is Book Talk with Corbin. I'm your host, and uh, folks, they call me coach because, well, that's what my students call me. Uh, we have a uh, Dr. William Allen with us. Uh, my, my listeners, you've, you've heard this, this brother before, very powerful. I'm always surprised at the reaction we get at, uh, with his interviews. People love him to death. Um, they really get a lot out of them. There's just no way, uh, you know, 15 minutes does his brother justice at all. And as you know, he's a professor of political science, emeritus dean of James uh, Madison College, and emeritus professor of political science at Michigan State University. And brother, you know, ordained pastor too, is that correct? That is correct, yes, a Baptist preacher. (laughs) And then um, you also at one time served as chairman and member of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. And uh, and at one time, you're you're currently stepping down as the chief operating officer at the Center for Urban Renewal and Education. And brother, why are you stepping down? Well, good, that's the first topic. I'm stepping down because of the advent of a contract to finish a project that I've been working on for 50 years. Wait a minute, did you say 50? 50, yeah, five zero. (laughs) That that is a translation of Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws. That is the 18th century work that gave us separation of powers and checks and balances and informed the writing of our constitution. So I've been translating that and writing a commentary on it and I have a contract with Anthem Press to get it out, and I have six months to do it. And I can't do that while continuing my work at Cure. But I have to tell everyone who knows Cure and cares about Cure that the last 12 months have been wonderful. And when I came in a year ago, it was to affect a turnaround, and we've been successful. Cure has been successful. This summer, you will see the emergence of the State of Black America report, which is only one of the several indices of that success we've had the past year. So I'm leaving it in a strong position. Uh, We've uh, designated a successor, and Cure is going to be going forward. It's fantastic fantastic to hear because Star Parker and her organization, Cure, they have a lot of fans here in the Commonwealth, Kentucky. Yes. So that, that's, that's, uh, that's great to hear. Brother, let's go straight into the interview because I understand that you have to go on to a graduation. Education just runs in your family, Dad. It certainly does. It's the story for us. <laughs> I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this uh, position paper that Cure put out in August 2019, Education Freedom, Cure Policy Briefing. And by the way, I've never heard it put that way, Education Freedom. Yes. And then... Um, I'm going to go by this three points of summary here. I'm going to go by the, the three points of summary, you know, one at a time. First one states here, public school system is controlled by government, bureaucrats, and unions. Could you elaborate on that a little bit, brother? There's no question about it. The development of American public education throughout the 20th century was, of course, revolutionary. It expanded from almost no public education to 100%. And in the course of that, government schools took over. I'll give you one illustration. Uh, There were, uh, throughout the South, there was a partnership between Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald, who was the founder of Sears Roebuck, of course. Hmm. And they created 500 Rosenwald schools to educate the former slaves, an extraordinary accomplishment. And yes, they did so cooperating with local authorities all along the way. But essentially, this was an indigenous operation coming from within the community supported by Rosenwald. And the, uh, the success, the rate at which within the co- black communities, the literacy rate increased to 50% over a short period of time is unparalleled in human history. And so what you yeah. saw there was what it happens when people take control of their lives and their education and act with freedom. But of course, over time, particularly in the era of separate but equal Jim Crow and enforced segregation, public authorities took over increasing control of all schools. And so you don't even know where a Rosenwald school is anymore because it got replaced by the public education system. Hmm. That public education system came to be dominated ultimately in the late 20th century by teacher unions. So you have two things working together. You have the power of the state making your choices for you and you have their alliance with the teachers union running the schools, not in the interest of the students, but in the interest of the teachers. 
so, so that we have lost in the communities the ability to control our education and therefore pursue those ambitions. So that's why freedom is an important word there. School choice is what we like to say today, but really the question is freedom. Being able as uh, individual parents uh, and communities to decide what our future is. That is the key to changing the educational landscape and to, of course, getting beyond what we call today the achievement gap. And this isn't just theory you're talking about here. It, like you said, Booker T. Washington, in cooperation with this highly successful business person, you said that was the founder of Sears, Susan yes. Robot? Yes. Together built 500? 500, that's the number. Explain. And out of that, Black literacy increased by how much? 50% in a short period of time. That is 50% of the population came to be literate when after slavery, of course, it was almost zero. Right. That is utterly amazing. But here's the other thing that really shocks me. I've never heard that before. People heard... don't tell this story enough, Mr. Sievers. They just don't. We need to remind ourselves who we were. I'll tell you a quick story. When I took teachers on a tour of the South and the civil rights monuments back in 2018, one of the places we stopped was Selma, Alabama, where, of course, the Great March took place for voting rights. And the team who were marching would gather in Big Bethel, Bethel AME Church, to plan their strategy and how they were going to handle this and get everybody in the right frame of mind. And so while I'm sitting there in the sanctuary at Big Bethel with these teachers explaining how all this happened, I stop in the middle of my presentation. I say, wait a minute, look around you, look up. Because mm -hmm. this is an absolutely beautiful example of architecture a monumental work. It was constructed in the first decade of the 20th century. And I said, who do you think built this? Mm -hmm. And there was silence. And then it began to dawn on them when I was really asking, because the answer was obvious. Why, it was those same black people who were subject to Jim Crow, subject to lynching, subject to every kind of oppression, but who were not oppressed, who were resourceful, competent, intelligent people, built this beautiful structure that still stands in its pristine purity. Mm -hmm. Well, that's true of education and so many other things and business as in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Why was it called the Black Wall Street? It wasn't because there were government programs that funded it. It was because people built it for themselves. So, so this resourcefulness in black communities is what we've lost sight of. And this is especially important when you're talking about education. And to get back to that resourcefulness, we have to regain control of our education. Well, you're doing it again, brother. You're giving us a we come in here looking for a little lunch and you're giving us a full buffet. Um, let's go to the second point. We don't have much time. We know that the key to the success of our success, key to the, to the success of our great American economy is freedom and competition. Yes. You just, just, could you just sort of give us a little bit more on that? Yeah, we, we, we have to remind people that when they start talking about the free market or capitalism or any of those things, they're not talking about some, something that comes from on high. They're talking about something that comes from the bottom up. It, it's mm. people exercising their freedom to trade and to produce and to become prosperous. That's the driver. That's what makes the difference. So, so that we know, because all history tells us that this did not become a great society on the basis of general policy, it became a great society on the basis of individual exertion. And, and, and you just really just touched upon that when you talked about Wall Street, you know, Black Wall Street, and yes. with Booker T. Washington and in, in collaboration with this uh, Susan Roebuck founder, and even, you know, Booker T. Washington and Tuskegee University period of our own volition, of our own, you know, grittiness, tenacity, resourcefulness we built from the ground up. Yes, I want to re-emphasize that because what people forget is that early in the 20th century when we were subject to so much brutalization and so much restriction from the state, it was the state acting in league with things like the Ku Klux Klan and others to repress that natural energy. It mm. wasn't the fact that black people weren't capable, uh, a statement that was made in Brown versus Board of Education by Justice Earl Warren, which is not true, it was the fact that we were so capable, we had to be repressed mm. by law, by the state, by the power of those who didn't want to see that advance. 
So that means we had already proved what we could do. We don't need to prove it again. That's what I say to people. We are not under a test anymore. We proved ourselves. We established not only our capacity as human beings, but we established our loyalty and patriotism to this country. And now the time is right for us to reassert that again. And now our last point here, it is impossible to consider our nation free when parents have no choice regarding how to educate their children. We need education choice. Absolutely, absolutely. Let, let's think of it this way. We've lived through a year and what we've been told over and over again is that all the rest of us have to follow the experts, follow the science, they tell us. Well, that's a big mistake. We have to follow our own judgment. We have to, as the children of Christ, who have been endowed by nature with these capacities, to make use of them. We don't need to defer. We don't need to be subject to a handful of elites who tell us what to do. We have to assert that we know how to raise our own children. We know how to educate ourselves. We know how to produce. We can tell you what the decisions ought to be. You shouldn't have to tell us what the decisions ought to be. He's speaking to the government, for example. So, so everything has been turned upside down in this whole welfare mentality. We've been taught to believe that we've got to sit and wait for somebody to bring us a plate before we can eat. No, we can go out and grow food. We can cook it and we can serve it. Yeah. We don't need somebody to bring us a plate. And, and that needs to be emphasized over and over again. Wow. Brother, thank you so much. We're going to end it right there because you know I'm going to be here the next couple of hours. And you're going to be upset with me, man. So, no, we, we ain't going to have that because I got to have you back. That that was just, that's it, just so powerful. And I want to emphasize to my listeners, this brother's not talking from theory. He's, he's told us, he's given us specific, just a few specific historical examples of what we, that, what we did. That we did this, you know. So, uh, brother, uh, brother, Dr. William Allen, I want to thank you, brother. Hope we can have you back again sometime. And I just, again, want to say to my listeners, look, it's real important that we, we watch these videos, we like these videos, and we share, share, share these videos. It's very important we do that. And, and brother, even though you are now engrossed in, in researching, et cetera, doing a lot of work with this new book, are you still available to do speaking engagements? Yes, certainly. I'm happy, especially to be able to talk to you. Fantastic. Brother? <laughs> Thank you so much. I will be in touch. All righty. Thank you so much and have a wonderful, blessed day.